Welcome, and I'm glad you joined, decided to join me to my talk, Backups and Snapshots with QMU. I'm Max, working as an intern for Red Hat. And I hope I won't bore you to death, especially after we've had like two talks in that direction um, before. John's talk just at 2 p.m. and Kashyap's talk yesterday. So if you are very much bored, you can just ask me very, very complicated but interesting questions in the end um, and make me sweat by that. But let's start first so that we actually have some time in the end that you can ask me questions in. So first, I'm going to start off with what kinds of backups there are in general, and especially what QMU supports, mostly in the scope of this talk, of course. So the most basic and versatile kind of backup, of course, is you have some file and you copy it somewhere else. Very, very basic, but also very vers versatile because you can copy it anywhere. You can copy it on the same disk into another directory, or you can copy it into some submarine bunker, um, depending on what your needs are. Now, um, of course, this is not very efficient, but efficiency is something you should solve after you've done it right. And this talks mostly about doing it right and not optimizing stuff. So when it comes to QMU, we have kind of this configuration. Um, you have a VM which has a couple of guest disks attached to it. And when you're doing a backup of the VM, what you want to do is, of course, save all the data of the VM, which is mostly situated on the guest disks. So in this talk, is going, it's going to be about um, what, how you can back up a disk which is attached to a virtual machine while the VM is running to some other file. And of course, since every guest disk can be represented by some image file, this backup will also be such an image file, which you could then um, reattach to some guest disk and then have the same VM running, basically. Now, as I said, this is not very efficient, of course. Um, so besides these real full backups, we also have this very light method of doing a backup, which is called a snapshot, um, which comes in very handy in certain circumstances. So let's say you have a virtual machine and you want to do some stuff in it where you think it'll make, it may break anything or everything, like install a new operating system where you think, like, oh, not sure how well that's going to be. So of course, you want to do a backup first before you destroy everything. Um, but doing a full backup takes a lot of time. Um, and also, you don't need the data security requirements of full backup. You don't need that data to stay in a secure place. It's fine to stay where it is. So what you can do is you take a snapshot first. A snapshot is this. You have some file, which is currently actively in use by input and output operations running on it. Um, and then what you do when you're taking the snapshot is you replace it atomically by some overlay file, which is completely empty. So whenever you try to read something from the overlay file, all the read operations get redirected to the snapshot because you can't read from the overlay because it is empty um, so far. Therefore, the overlay file appears to be exactly the same as the old file, which is now the snapshot. Um, and the snapshot is no longer written to. It's locked, so it's frozen in time as the snapshot. Um, instead, everything is now going through the overlay. And when you're writing stuff to the overlay, of course, it gets put there. Um, and then when you're reading that back, it gets read from the overlay and not from the um, original file, of course. So this allows you to have a point in time snapshot, um, like a freeze a file in time, um, so you can later return to it if you find out that what you did was actually bad. And of course, you can also take just another snapshot of an existing snapshot um, uh, or an existing overlay and then have multiple points in time where you have these snapshots and later return to any of them if you so desire. With QMU, it looks like this. You have some guest disk to which a disk image is attached. And then taking a snapshot means you replace that disk image by some other disk image, um, which uh, is partially allocated. That means the format of this file has to have a way of storing which areas are allocated and which are not, so that you know which areas have been written to already. And if you encounter an area that has not been written to, of course, you fall back to the original file. So the format also has to have a way of uh, specifying uh, where the original file is. That is, that is, it has to support backing images. For instance, QCA2 is, of course, such a format. Um, these, form these snapshots are what we call external snapshots because um, the snapshot and the overlay are two different files. But certain uh, image formats supported by QMU, mostly QCA2, also support internal snapshots, 
where all the overlays and all the snapshots are stored within a single file. Um, in this case, the snapshots are then identified through some name instead of a file name. Um, yeah, we'll get later to whether you should use internal or external snapshots, but I can say now that it's mostly a matter of taste. There's, I don't think there is a real reason whether you should use one or the other. Now, after we've seen what kind of backups there are, we can talk about how not to do backups because a lot of people do that wrong, um, which is also a reason why this talk exists. So we've received a couple of bug reports which were like, help, everything's broken. So zooming in on this, uh, we can see that all in all of these bug reports, uh, QMU was corrupting QK2 images. That is, um, someone did something to the VM and suddenly QMU was not able to open a QK2 image anymore because it was completely broken. Um, this is always bad because it means that people have lost all their valuable data and it's something that just should never happen. Um, but zooming in on them um, even further, we find out, found out that it's not really fully QMU's uh, issue, but the people who reported the bugs were doing something wrong and that is they took internal snapshots using the QMU IMG tool on a QK2 image while, uh, while the virtual machine was running. Which is a bit like you're going on the highway at 100 kilometers an hour and your brakes are gone and you think, well, I'm just gonna use the handbrake. It's a bad idea that might work if you know exactly what you're uh, doing, but it's still a bad idea. And in general, we can say that you should just never write to a disk image from two processes at the same time because it just may break horribly and it probably will. Um, but still, of course, this is a bad issue. Um, QMU should never corrupt QK2 images. So we have to do something about this. We can't just say, well, you did it wrong. So the first thing um, that's currently being worked on is image locking, which means that once you attach a virtual image, uh, a disk image to a virtual machine, then the virtual machine process, the QMIC process, has to make sure that the image is locked and that the external process can no longer access it. This is being worked on, but this will just prevent people from doing, um, from corrupting their images, um, but it will also prevent them from doing their backups. Now, of course, they did the backups wrong, so this is a good thing, but still. So we have to do something more positive, which is inform people on how to do backups right, which, of course, is why this talk exists because it's actually very simple just to tell the virtual machine process itself, the QMU process, to take a snapshot and to do backups and all of that, and we'll do that for you. Um, and it's very, very simple if you know how to do it. Um, so this is why this talk exists, so that I can tell everyone how to do it. Um, which is what this part is about, of course. First, we'll have to talk about the interface um, you have to use to access QMU and to tell it to do something which Kashyap and John have already talked about, which is QMP. QMP stands for QMU Monitor Protocol. So as the name implies, it's mostly a protocol um, and an API for management applications to control a virtual machine while it is running. So for instance, Lipford, it can pause the virtual machine, can zoom it, can add devices, remove devices, and much more. Um, when you build a QMU, you get a file called QMP commands.txt in the build directory, which contains all the commands there are with a description, all the parameters, and so on. Now, while this is mainly thought for management applications, it's based on JSON, so you can actually very, very well just use it yourself. Just append this option to the QMU command line dash QMP SCDIO, and you will get a QMP interface on the command line. And then you can go wild and just try it out for yourself. So on the line, QMP looks like this. It consists of JSON objects. When you want to send a command, you, use, uh, you send a JSON object which contains an execute key whose value is just the name of the command. And then you can pass some arguments, all of course with the name and their value. And if that argument was executed successfully, then you'll get a JSON object back from QMU which contains a return key, maybe with some value, maybe not, depends on the command. If you did something wrong, then you'll get an error, which is just a JSON object with an error key. And the, all of these are of course uh, synchronous operations, so you send a comment and you get a response, which may be a return or an error. There is also the asynchronous event, where QMU may send you a, a JSON object with an event key at any time, and then you'll have to do something with it, or you don't. Depends on you. So it's actually just very simple to write as a human, too. You can, of course, uh, use your own scripts. Kashab talked yesterday about the being this uh, 
the QMP script, a helper script, which uh, is part of QMU so that you can have a more, bit more simpler syntax. But of course, you can also just include it in your scripts if you so desire. For instance, let's, let's say you have a virtual machine which you want to parse. You can do that using the stop command. So you just send um, a JSON object with the execute key whose value is stop. And then while QMU is executing that command, you will get a stop event telling you that the machine has actually stopped execution. And after that, the command will have been executed successfully. So QMU will just return again to you. In the following slides, I'll use a slightly, slightly shorter comment notation, which looks like this. So instead of just writing the full JSON object for executing some comment, I'll just write the name of the comment in front of the parenthesis, and then write all the arguments with their names and values in the parenthesis. So it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, I think. It should be pretty obvious how that works. Now let's come to the interesting part, which is how can you use QMP to actually create snapshots on a virtual machine while it is running? And there's actually not much to say about it. There's the block to snapshot internal sync command for internal snapshot, which takes two parameters, the first of which is the name of the block device to which the disk image is attached that you want to create an internal snapshot in. And the other one is the name you want to give to the new snapshot. So let's say you have this configuration where you have a disk, Im uh, a virtual uh, guest drive to which a guest, uh, uh, disk image is attached which already has two internal snapshots called one and two, very imaginative, uh, very imaginative. And you want to create a third sna snapshot called it three. So you execute the block to snapshot internal sync command with the parameters, device is disk zero, and the new name is number three. So what happens is that QMU will do that for you. So it's actually very, very simple. For external snapshots, there's the block to snapshot sync command, which works very similarly takes the name of the block device again, and the name of the overlay image you want to create. Now, this parameter is called the snapshot file parameter, but it actually takes the name of the overlay you want to create, not of the snapshot, because you don't move that anywhere. So that's a bit confusing, but yeah, it's just how it is. And finally, it takes uh, the format you want to, the new overlay image to be in, so normally QCO2, I guess. And it also takes a couple of more parameters, but those are all listed in the QMP commands the TXT file if you're so inclined. Now, um, if you want to basically create an external snapshot with the same configuration we had before, we have a guest disk called disk zero to which a disk image is attached that you now want to snapshot. You can execute the block to snapshot sync command on disk zero the new file is supposed to uh, be named foo.qca2, and it's supposed to be in qca2 format. So you just execute that command in QMP, and that will happen. So no surprise there. Very simple. So there's really no reason to use QMUIMG on an image while it is attached to a VM, because you can really just use the VM itself. It's very, very simple. Or you can, of course, use libvirt, but I guess these people have reasons for not using libvirt or you do, um, because maybe you want to write your own management tools. Now, when we're talking about um, backups itself, copying data off, um, that gets, gets a bit more complicated because the problem is that all these black, uh, snapshot commands were synchronous. You start them, they do something for a very, very short time, and then they basically instantaneously return to you. The problem with uh, backups, with real backups, is that you have to copy data somewhere, so it takes a lot of time. Now, QMP basically blocks the VM execution. So when you're executing a comment, the VM will more or less stop during that time. So you don't really want to have long-running command because that would be bad. So that's what we have block jobs for. Block jobs work like this. You have some background operation, which you can start using a QMP command. So you just invoke the QMP command, and it will, again, immediately return to you. But in the background, the, bl the block job itself will continue to run. And after it has continued, uh, after it has completed, it will send you a, an event that it actually has. For example, uh, or generally, this looks like this. You have uh, some comment which starts the block job, which is generally just the name of the block job. And by executing this, you will just start the block job, of course, and QMU will return instantly to you. Um, you can give a job ID to the job so you can later identify it, which makes sense. And then after some time, you'll just get a 
block job, completed event with the name of the block job in there. The fact that this is called device here instead of job ID is legacy craft, which of course we always have to deal with in all areas uh, and here too. Now, um, there are block jobs which don't immediately complete, but they have a ready phase first. That means um, after the initial operation has completed, they will not send a block job completed event, but a block job ready event. And then you have to manually tell it to complete using the block job complete command. And only then will it generate a completion event, which on the line looks like you'd expect it. You get a block job ready event, and then you send block job complete command, and then you get the block job completed event. This doesn't make, probably doesn't make much sense if you're seeing this for the first time, but we'll later see a block job for this, for which this is necessary, and we'll see why this is the case. Okay, now we can actually see what kinds of block jobs there are that can help us doing a backup. And not much surprisingly, that block job, the main block job is called drive backup, which just copies a guest disk's data to another file. And the state of the other file, that is the state of the data that will be contained therein, is just the same as the state of the guest disk was at the start of the block job. So you will go always get a consistent state in, in the backup. But that also means that whenever the guest writes to some area in the image file uh, on the virtual disk, and QMU has not yet written that area to the backup file, QMU will first have to copy that off and can only then let the guest continue writing to that area. So if you have heavy I.O. in the guest and you're doing a backup at the same time, then the guest may get slowed down by quite a bit, which I don't think is too surprising, but it's worth mentioning anyway. The four main arguments for drive backup are these. Um, first, again, takes the name of the source device you want to copy. Second is the target file where you want to copy the data to. And this file name, of course, can be in the, can be any file that QMU would support for creating and opening. So um, it may be, for instance, on some SSH server too. Uh, the sync parameter specifies what exactly to copy. We'll come to that in a second. And with the mode parameter, you can specify whether you want to create the target file or reuse an existing one. So the sync parameter becomes very useful when you have a snapshot chain like this attached to a guest disk where you have multiple overlays and multiple snapshots and all of them reference each other. And now you can specify using the sync parameter what of this data you exactly want to copy. If you specify sync equals full, then you will just copy everything. That is, all the data will be collapsed into the backup image and the backup image will then be a standalone representation of the original guest disk. So this is probably the most basic one. You can also use sync equals top, which will just uh, copy the data contained in the topmost overlay image. But this, of course, means that then your backup image will depend on all the other images in the backing chain or in the snapshot chain. We also call that the backing chain. And then, of course, your backup becomes pretty much useless if, in the event of data loss, you also lose this image, these images. But, of course, the backup is faster and requires less space. Then there is sync equals none, which, however, is pretty weird for drive backup, so I won't go into that to further detail. If you want to take a look, you can look into QMP commands.txt, and it will roughly explain what it does. But it's most definitely out of scope for this talk. Also out of scope for this talk is sync equals incremental, for which John and Vladimir did a great talk last year. Or actually, it was just John, because Vladimir was unfortunately not able to be there in person. And this is not out of scope because it's so weird, but it's out of scope because it's so complex. <coughs> um, it's very, uh, very, very useful, actually, because it allows you to copy all the data that has changed from the last backup you did. So I guess you can see how that is useful because it saves you disk space and time during the copy. So definitely take a look into that talk um, if you're interested. I hope you're interested. And besides drive backup, we also have the drive mirror block job, which does more or less the same but it's for another use, for another use case. Um, because what it does is that it also copies data to another location, but it does not copy the data as it was at the beginning of the backup, but at the end of the backup, which of course is essential for storage migration, where you want to move some disk image to another host. So you can use DriveMirror to do that for you, where you copy all the data to the new host, 
And once the drive mirror block job completes, you can move over to the new host and abandon the old image. Um, in contrast to drive backup, drive mirror also does not stall the guest on any guest requests, but it may copy the same error repeatedly. So if you have already, if some data has already been been written to the target image and the guest writes to that area again, of course you'll have to recopy that. And this block job, in contrast to drive backup, actually has a ready face. And if you then issue the block job complete command, then QMU does what it is supposed to do for storage migration, which is it will pivot to the target. That is, it will abandon the old image and instead open the target image and attach that to the guest disk, which is probably not what you want for, drive backup, for a backup. In that case, you probably want to run block job cancel, which will then just leave the target image alone and leave it as a backup, kind of. Um, the question whether you should be using drive mirror or drive backup is basically up to you. It's kind of a matter of taste. I personally would use drive backup because the name implies that it's to be used for backups and also because drive backup actually supports the incremental sync, up, sync mode, which drive mirror does not. And this is not just a case of we don't want to have it for drive mirror, but it's a case of it would be very hard to implement. So if you have a very, if you have very good reason for using drive mirror, go ahead, use it. Libvirt does too, as far as I'm aware. If you want to use drive backup, go ahead. So, matter of taste there. Now, when you've done a block, when you've done a backup, normally you have to do something with it too. There are two things you can do with it. The first thing is you can roll back to it. That is, you've crashed your system or your hardware has failed, and you now want to get the old data back. So, how can you do that? For backups and external snapshots, that means you switch off the virtual machine, and then you just replace the active image, which is attached to the virtual machine, by the backup. So it's just some file operations, and that's it. For internal snapshots, you also have to first switch off the VM, and then you can use the QMUIMG tool to revert to an old snapshot. Now, in both cases, you have to switch off the VM first. So as far as I'm aware, there is no live operation to revert to an old snapshot, uh, to an old backup but that wouldn't make much sense anyway because reverting to an old snapshot means that you actively modify the data that the guest sees, which is something you probably don't want to do while the guest is running anyway. Hopefully, you don't have to roll back. Hopefully, you just have to discard your backup, which you have to do if you run out of disk space or a backing chain, like this chain of external snapshots. If it gets very long, then you get kind of a performance degradation because QMU may have to visit a very, uh, very large number of images until it finds that image where the data is actually contained in. So at some point in time, you probably want to shorten the chain, um, maybe because of performance, maybe because of space. So how can you do that? For internal snapshots, it's the most simplest one um, because we have the block dev snapshot delete internal sync command, which is incident incidentally the longest name of any QMP command that we have. And it takes two parameters or more if, you so, if you're so inclined. First of which is the name of the block device, again, just like any other. And the second of which is the name of the snapshot you want to delete. And you just execute that, and then it'll do that for you. For external snapshots, it's a bit more complicated because um, in the external snapshot case, let's say you have this chain of snapshots and overlay, and you want to drop these two images from the chain. So, of course, these images contain some data that may be visible to the guests. So you first have to copy that data somewhere else before you can delete these files. And for that, we have two block jobs which can do that. First of which is the block stream block job, which will co uh, copy that data up the chain. That is, they will contain, uh, copy that to the topmost overlay. And this block job takes um, a base argument with which you can specify which images you want to keep. So if this image were your, was your base image, then only this image would be copied to the overlay file. And after all the data has been copied, then QMU will just drop these images from this snapshot chain, and you can then manually delete the files because they're no longer in use. This is the same text form if you want to read it at home. And you can also copy the data in the other direction for which we have the block commit block job, which does, of course, just copy the data in the other direction. But it also takes two parameters, and those are top and base, so you can also specify the top image which you want to keep or which you don't want to keep anymore. So if this image was your top image, then only this image would be copied to the base image. 
So the difference between block commit and block stream is basically that in the case of block commit, what you're doing is you're updating an old snapshot, whereas in the case of block stream, you're updating an overlay. So if you don't want to um, update a snapshot, which may be reasonable because snapshots are supposed to be read only, then you can just use block stream in the other direction then. Same text form again. And for backups, it just kind of depends. Um, if you have a standalone backup, that is, you just create all your backups using sync equals full, then of course you can just delete the backup file if you don't need it anymore. But if you're using incremental backups or any way where the backups depend on each other in a backing file relationship, then you have to use some tool to copy the data somewhere else, such as you have to do um, in the external snapshot case. And QMU IMG commit can do that for you. It actually does the very same thing as the commit block job. So that's what you can use then. And after you've copied the data somewhere else, you can then just delete the backup file. Now the question, of course, is which one should you use? Um, and the question is only easily answered for the snapshot versus backup case. Because you probably always want to do a snapshot if you can. But there are many cases where you can't. If you need the data security, of course you have to do a backup, because you have to do a backup. If for some reason you don't want to use QCOT2 at all, you have to do a full backup because you, use, uh, you need to use some format such as QCOT2 with backing image support for snapshots. So that's, imp that's easy. But the comparison between internal and external snapshots is more difficult. It's, as I said, mostly a matter of taste. If you've used internal snapshots all your life long, then Go ahead, continue to use them. If you like external snapshots more because you know them, I don't know, from libvirt or stuff, then just continue to use external snapshots. There is a small difference in the speed in which the operations go. So taking, rolling back, and discarding an internal snapshot always takes kind of a bit of time because you have to do some f uh, metadata updates in the QCO2 file. So it's not as quick as it could be, but it's reasonably quick. Whereas for external snapshots, taking them and rolling back to them is very quick because it just means creating a uh, basically empty new file or moving a file, uh, renaming a file, or stuff like that. But discarding an external snapshot takes a lot of time because as you have just seen, you have to use the block stream or block commit block job to copy it somewhere else. So if that makes a difference to you, then this is a criterion uh, on which you can decide whether to use internal or external snapshots. Now, I hope I haven't bored you too much. Um, if I have, you can now pay me back, of course. This isn't a question, it's a remark. Uh, internal versus external snapshots may be a matter of taste, but if you happen to have a taste for thoroughly tested code that is in heavy production use, <laughs> then stick to external back uh, snapshots. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I have two remarks and one question. Can you show previous slide, please? This one? Yes. Uh, there is one thing that we should also take into account. Uh, the amount of space uh, we will need to perform the operation. Yeah. Uh, well, so this internal, for internal snap... For internal and external snapshots, it's kind of the same because you always need to store all the new data you have written somewhere. Um, for a backup, you need more data, of course. I think no. For okay. internal snapshot, we do not space at all. And for external snapshot, with the current implementation, we will need additional space on discard. Because during discard, you will have to have That's right. yes. spare space equal to the delta you are going to discard. That's it. Yes, that's right. Uh, Second side note is about internal snapshot. Uh, you can use, say, VM to create internal snapshot with RAM. So you will be able to get to the back it up state in running state without uh, downtime, and you will obtain VM is in exactly the, uh, that state you have performed the backup. And the question is, <laughs> If we are using backup, uh, we have a fundamental problem right now with the current implementation. Because we use synchronous notifier to perform the operation, we first write the data to backup, and when this operation is completed, we will perform operation on 
the main disk. If we perform the backup on the network storage, for example, like NFS, the guest will stall until if yes. NFS somehow will go down. And that could be a problem. Yes, that's when you should use drive mirror because they would. Yeah. Um, speaking of dry mirror, so Livebird uses dry mirror for its backup mechanism. So oftentimes on IRC or on mailing list, people ask, um, due to the limitation of not able to restart a copy job while the guest is running, so Libbert does this hack of undefining a guest definition, perform the copy job. Once it's finished, you redefine it. So um, how could this be solved? Um, I, I've heard of um, the list. That they are on the list as well, as well. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, um, on the list as well about um, persistent dirty bitmaps will resolve the steam. Yeah, the, uh, okay. persistent dirty bitmaps would be a, a part of the incremental backup stuff, which John talked extensively about in his last talk. So it's still under development. It's, uh, yeah, well, persistent dirty bitmaps are still completely under development. So that is something we don't have yet and we'll hopefully have in the future. So yeah, of course you can use that to continue a backup after it's failed too. I uh, two, uh, two questions or two concerns actually with, uh, uh, I've been using this uh, a lot. And uh, uh, one is uh, when a disk goes full, there is no notification back to the VM as far as I know. And I think uh, there should be. Maybe. Normally you get a block job error event that the uh, block job has stopped um, and that I, I mean if you just con if you have a QM uh, yeah. di uh, instance running and uh, the host disk goes full yes do you get an event then? yes you should there is you a um, there is a block job error event so, that's so I'm, I don't know thing. about the exact details but as far as I'm aware there should there is an event that you get and it should be a block job error event which tells you that there is no space left on the target device and you can configure whether you want to stop your block job in that case or whether you want to report an error just or don't want to do anything yeah okay uh, and the second question is uh, uh, kind of concern more I don't know if you have any uh, thoughts made any thoughts around it and that is when, when you have uh, an operating system that writes a lot of files and then removes them again or if you have you mean in the guest in the guest yeah the yeah. guest is running for a while and creates a lot of space and there's yes. numerous ways you can zero out uh, disks again and then there's kind of lots of work to get them trimmed down again once you use the snapshot mechanism if you use snapshots over time they will a lot of kind of data will accumulate yes. because of uh, So you mean every snapshot will have redundant data? In yeah, there. kind of. And we have the QM, you have the offline tool, QMUMG, um, which has a, re a rebase command, which you can use to trim snapshots down. Um, mm. So you can just rebase it on, the, on its own backing file, and then it will remove all, that's, um, all, all the craft. But it's an offline tool, so um, as far as I'm aware, we don't have a, an online operation for that. So there is no kind of ideas around whether or not it's possible to do something virtual or something? Like this no, but I, I think actually I've, I've heard about the, the rebase comment only yesterday. I think it would maybe actually be a good idea to have a rebase block job. I think hmm. that would make sense. So first of all, the guest would need to send discard snaps so that the host yes. knows which blocks are not used by the files. Yeah, so something like that. But that's the core. Yeah, but it doesn't do anything if you've already taken a snapshot. It will only discard in the yeah. new snapshot. Thanks, man. Thank you.